Good morning, Pastor Ed Kropa here from Hope Lutheran Church in Freehold, New Jersey with daily devotions for Monday, November the 30th, 2020, the last day of the month. Can you believe it's going to be December already? Moreover, yesterday we entered into the season of the church year known as Advent, the beginning of a new church year, uh, a season of waiting and watching, of preparation and anticipation waiting not only for Christ's coming as a newborn child at Christmas, but also his second coming in glory at the end of time as well. Our first reading for this week, the first week of Advent, is from the book of Isaiah, the 64th chapter. And it comes to us from a time when the people of Israel have returned from the Babylonian exile, and it deals with their struggles, not the least of which is their concern over God's continued presence in their lives. However, before we continue to explore this morning's reading further, let's begin first, as we always do, with the service of responsive prayer, namely the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, and Martin Luther's morning prayer. Let us begin. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I believe in God the Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have protected us through the night from all harm and danger. We ask that you would also protect us today from sin and all evil, so that our life and actions may please you. Into your hands we commend ourselves, our bodies, our souls, and all that is ours. Let your holy angels be with us, so that the wicked foe may have no power over us. Amen. Almighty God, bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, our reading this morning is taken from the 64th chapter of Isaiah, um, a book that has 66 chapters. Very interesting sort of story and background in that, and we don't have nearly the time it would take. Um, But this is from the latter half, uh, again, from a time uh, after the, the Babylonian exile when the the returning um, people are are struggling a little bit with uh, with coming back home and, and where God fits into all of this. And it goes like this. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you, who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned, because you had hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. And yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember in, remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. I don't know if you 
notice, but there's really kind of two halves to that reading. The first half is is kind of asking for God to, you know, like come down, you know, in, in a dramatic show of your of your power and might. You know, the way you've done in the past is kind of recounting uh, the memories of of God's uh, uh, powerful presence in their lives throughout their history. But then there's a sense in the second half of the reading of like, you know, but where are you? We, you know, um, you seem hidden from us, and and we're struggling. We we recognize how we have um, failed you and ourselves. Um, we're like a filthy cloth. Um, we fade like a leaf. Um, you know, so it, it's pleading for for God to. Um, again, make his presence known among them. Uh, one, one scholar commented on it this way, this lesson is simultaneously rooted in the rich memories of God's saving acts and mired in the muck of dashed expectations and the experience of God's absence. So they remember God's mighty deeds in the past, but in the present they seem to be you know, struggling and, and suffering and, and recognize that, that much of it is, is their own fault. The, uh, there's a commentary um, uh, passage about this particular lesson written by a Christopher Davis that I found really, really helpful. So I'd like to, to read part of it for you this morning. Um, apparently he has a son uh, of the same name. When my son Christopher was a boy, I took him to Toys R Us, and he got detached from me. Christopher being my first child, my fatherly instincts caused me to panic. And yet because I could see the doors, I knew that he had not exited the building. I paced up one corridor, down another, around a corner, around another aisle, peeping, looking to find him amidst a crowd of people in the Christmas rush. But I could not find my son. I found a security guard and asked him, do you have surveillance in the store? And he said, yes. And I then asked, do you have a monitor? And he said, yes. Can I look at the monitor? Yes. Can you scan the floor? Yes. And the guard began to scan up and down the aisles, and there I saw my son surrounded by toys and yet crying. He was clearly in a state of panic. My son was all by himself among people he did not know. My son was feeling lost and alone, and I did not know what to do. I asked the guard, do you have an intercom? Yes. I said, keep the camera on him. And then I got on the intercom and said, Christopher. And my son looked around because he, he recognized my voice. And I continued, stay where you are. And he started looking around. It's daddy, I said. Don't move. I see you, although you can't see me. Stay where you are. I'm coming. There's another uh, person who's written on this passage who talks about how young children like to play the game of hide and seek and uh, how they think if um, they close their eyes and like are partially hidden that we can't see them and, and they can't see us. And, and when I read that and even this, um, this passage from Christopher Davis, I'm reminded of my grandson, uh, Liam and I looked up on my phone. We've got some video of him where he uh, he's playing with his dad, and he's got a like a, a blanket that he pulls over his head, and he thinks he's disappeared. And his dad goes, "Where's Liam?" And he pulls it down and laughs, and and then he puts it back up again. And again, he thinks he's disappearing. Is Li where where's Liam? I can't see Liam. Um, he also when he came to visit us. Um, stood behind the, the the drapes, you know, his feet sticking out, his body partially visible, but you know he thinks we can't see him. Or um, uh, when uh, uh, also they sent us some video where he was in his backyard and he walked up up against the the, the outside wall of the house and put his face against there and closed his eyes, and again he thought he was invisible. Well. It's it's that kind of idea that uh, the way a young child is that that uh, Isaiah seems to be talking about here. Um, again, that Christopher Davis writes in those moments when you think that God cannot see you or that you cannot see God, always remember that God sees you 
The invisible hand of God is active and is looking after your life. And he continues, in Isaiah 64, the children of Israel were much like my son in Toys R Us. They, they cried out from, for help from someone they could not see, nor could they be sure that they were seen. And while on intercom, an intercom was sufficient to announce my arrival to my son, the prophet asks for something far more dramatic. He prays and asks for an announcement of God's presence in ways that would garner respect and recognition from both the children of Israel and God's enemies, who they viewed as their own enemies. They cried out for quaking mountains, burning brushwood, and boiling water. How often do we all feel that way, that we're, we're lost and confused, um, and God seems hidden and absent from us, and yet that's not true. But it feels that way. And very often it's because of our actions that, that we've, we're hiding from God, knowingly or, or unknowingly. Um, and so we search, we look for reassurance. And the people of Israel did as well. Uh, they wanted to know that, that God was still in their lives, that God was still watching over them. And so that Christopher Davis again closes uh, his remarks by saying this passage closes with an impassioned appeal for God to look favorably on the people of Israel, to forget their sins against God and to remember that they are God's people. I'm inclined, he says, to believe that the weight had far less to do with God remembering than it did with the people remembering, remembering that God is our caring and concerned parent. God might be disappointed with our behavior. God might have allowed us to engage in self-destructive behavior. God might have allowed us to shrivel up and blow away like a leaf in winter. But God's purpose has never been our destruction. God's hope is the hope of a parent who always hopes against hope that the children will see the error of their ways and return home. And then he ends with how Isaiah ends. Do not be exceedingly angry, O God, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. A message, a timeless message right there in Isaiah. It comes from a specific time in their history, but the circumstances are so so true and so uh, reminiscent of our own struggles at times, of of knowing that we have um, hidden ourselves from God and and yet um, we're concerned that, that God is the one hiding and really um, that couldn't be, as again, couldn't be further from the truth. God is always watching over us and uh, uh, just because like a young child we close our eyes and put our face against the wall or hide behind the drapes or put a blanket over our head, that doesn't mean that God is not still watching over us and caring for us again the way a loving parent would. Reassuring words to be sure. Well, let's close this morning uh, with the prayer for the week. Deliver us from harm, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine on us that we may be saved through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, I hope you have a great start to the week. Looking forward to being back together with you again tomorrow. Take care.